Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't have anything off the top. Um, Simon, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Can we uh, go to the West Bank sure. um, and the killing of an of a American citizen? Um, could you tell us a bit more after the statement was put out on, on Friday? Um, you know, is there any more you can tell us about the, um, this incident and what you've been able to find out about? So uh, I don't have any um, additional information for you, Simon. We, uh, as we said on Friday, we are um, aware of the very tragic death of an American citizen, um, uh, Aisha Noor, um, as uh, Guy I G, um, in the West Bank, and. Um, we offer our deepest condolences to her family and uh, and her loved ones. Uh, we have urged a swift, thorough, and transparent investigation and are urgently working to get more information as possible as it relates to the circumstances of her death. We have no higher priority than the safety and security of American citizens, um, especially those that are abroad. Uh, our understanding is that our uh, partners in Israel are looking into the circumstances of what is uh, what happened, and, and we expect them to make their findings public and uh, expect that whatever those findings are, uh, expect them to be um, thorough and transparent. Uh, but I don't have uh, any additional information around the circumstances beyond that, Simon. You said you're ad urgently working to get more information. What does that involve? What, who are you talking to? So uh, obviously having uh, conversations with with, uh, partners in the Israeli government and uh, as well as uh, the uh, deceased individual's family um, but I don't have any I, I didn't say that to mean that there is some sort of separate um, American investigation or anything like that we are simply um, just trying to gather some more information uh, as and uh, understand that there is a sort of formal process um, that we expect uh, our partners in Israel to announce their findings of why wouldn't there be an American investigation into the, into the killing of an American? So uh, th that uh, that process would not uh, live at the State Department, should there be one. Of course, uh, when there is uh, when American citizens are killed, uh, especially abroad, that is something that uh, uh, would happen at the Department of Justice. I'm certainly not going to speak to that process or, or, or speak for another agency. Um, we have uh, focused our efforts on um, providing appropriate uh, consular services uh, for this individual's family and um, supporting them in that process while also uh, working with our, our partners in Israel to try to get any uh, additional information that we can uh, as it relates to what transpired. Uh, and we're hoping that that um, uh, it can be made public um, as soon as possible. Uh, just, just I mean, a lot of people looking at this incident have pointed out the uh, what seems to be a double standard or or a different treatment of this death, you know, death of a of an American citizen uh, at the hands of Israeli forces to you know other incidents where Americans have been killed in the conflicts in the Middle East um, or, or injured. You know, obviously there are there are different circumstances, but the, the president in a in relation to to um, some, an attack by Iranian proxies <clears throat> earlier this year said, if you harm an American, we will respond. Does that apply in this case, or are we talking about a different standard? Well, it's clear to anybody, Simon, that what the president was talking about in that context was a uh, terrorist attack or a direct attack um, uh, from a state or non-state actor that uh, intentionally uh, was conducted to put Americans or American citizens in harm's way. Um, and of course, when it comes to the protection of our citizens and our personnel, and if they are targeted, we of course will take uh, appropriate action. In, as it relates to the events on Friday, we are still gathering information as it relates to what transpired, what happened, uh, and as tragic as, as it is, and it is tragic, it is tragic any time uh, anybody loses their life, any civilian uh, loses their life. Uh, for people who work at this department, it is uh, especially tragic when an American citizen uh, loses their life. Uh, but we still don't uh, know uh, uh, with full certainty uh, what transpired and what happened, and that's why we are uh, working to uh, get as much information as we can, as well as encouraging our partners in Israel to uh, quickly uh, 
and robustly uh, conduct and conclude their process and make their findings uh, public so we can uh, understand uh, what happened. And should whatever happened uh, deem that uh, there be appropriate accountability, uh, the United States would uh, certainly uh, expect that as well. Um, Going back to what I was saying before, it is, it is of course, tragic when any um, civilian loses their life, uh, but it is important to note what you said, Simon, which is that each circumstance is different, um, and it is uh, really important to, uh, to, to keep that in mind uh, in these processes. Just the way that you're describing that sounds like you, know, you, haven't, you haven't sort of... Um, obviously, you don't know exactly what transpired, but do you have doubt that it was an Israeli bullet? That uh, I am not uh, going to get ahead of uh, a process here, Simon. Um, obviously, there has been a great deal of open source and public reporting and eyewitness reporting about uh, what transpired on Friday, um, and, and I certainly will let those comments and those reportings be. But uh, I think most important is to let this process play out for the facts to be gathered and for those uh, to come to light. Um, and, and I will just leave it at that. Yeah, I'll let my colleagues go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to um, Nadia in the back and then you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Vedan. So yeah. you say uh, you're still seeking more information regarding killing of Aisha or three days after uh, her killing in the West Bank. Actually, all the information available indicate, indicate that she was killed by an Israeli sniper. Uh, eyewitnesses say that she was killed by an Israeli sniper. Autopsy reports say that she was shot in the head uh, by an Israeli sniper. Your ally, NATO ally, Turkey, says that she was murdered uh, by Israel. So what sort of information you are looking for? Do you have any doubt that she was killed by Israel? I, I, I appreciate uh, all that you're sharing, but there is a process that we have to respect and let play out here. Our, our partners in Israel have indicated that they are uh, conducting a process and that they will uh, make public their findings. Uh, again, we expect that to happen um, as swiftly as possible, and we expect that process to be thorough. We expect that process to be um, transparent. Of course, eyewitness uh, reporting and facts from those that were there are, of course, important. Uh, but there are, of course, other factors that uh, go into such a finding. And I, I, we're going to let that process play out. I understand um, how troubling uh, this news um, was, is, continues to be. It's troubling for, uh, for all of us as well. Uh, but it's also important that we uh, not get ahead of the processes that are laid out. But you were, you were very quick to determine uh, that Israeli-American uh, Hirsch Goldberg was killed by Hamas in Gaza. And have you ever sought for further information regarding his killing? And if, you know, why haven't you shown the same quick response and reaction to the killing of Aisha Nur? So, respectfully, uh, Rabia, I understand that um, how tragic uh, this loss of life was um, and uh, how deeply heartbreaking it is uh, for so many people. Um, but as I said to Simon, each circumstance is different. And let's uh, be really clear and make sure that we are not conflating um, the murder, the direct murder uh, of uh, American and Israeli citizens, uh, hostages being held by a terrorist group, uh, being murdered by uh, members of Hamas. Uh, each circumstance is unique and different, and any time an American citizen or a civilian loses their life, it is uh, incredibly tragic. But the circumstances around how those ha that happens uh, is important. The facts uh, matter, and I am just not going to get ahead of uh, the process uh, as it relates to this. I should not family called for an independent investigation? Would you support this call? So, look, uh, you, what you just heard me say to, to Simon, we expect Israel to uh, make their findings uh, public. Um, we expect those findings uh, to be shared, you know, transparently and as thoroughly and as soon as possible. Uh, beyond that, I'm just not going to get ahead of uh, what those uh, findings um, determine, and should that uh, those require any additional steps needing to be taken. Said, well, go ahead. Thank you, Vidan. Yeah. Do you actually condemn the actual act of killing an, an American citizen protesting, uh, you know, 
the aggression of, let's say, the Israeli occupation army. So you condemn the act of the killing itself. Let's you condemn that act? Let's just be uh, very clear. Of course, uh, we would condemn the death. Uh, uh, we, we would, uh, we, we, uh, the death of any American citizen right. is heartbreaking. Um, but let's be just very uh, precise and clear that I uh, am not going to speculate on what transpired on, uh, on, on Friday, as those facts and those, those processes are still being determined and adjudicated, and we're going to let that process play out. Uh, it is troubling. It is tragic, uh, and it certainly uh, uh, there is a uh, responsibility here to share as much information as possible, um, so that um, uh, Miss Ig's family has uh, the most appropriate uh, accounting of what exactly transpired and what happened here. Mm -hmm. uh, but Said, there is a process, and I'm just not going to uh, get ahead of that. And I will. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of our, our partners so, in Israel. So you actually condemn the act of the killing, of the murder of an American citizen. Of course, Said, the murder of any American citizen, we would take issue with. Oh, okay. So let me fo just follow up. And Beta, you know, this is, there, is, there are protests in Beta every day. And in fact, 14 have been killed in the last maybe 12 months or so uh, in Beta. It's a very peaceful protest. There is never any stones thrown out and so on. There are actual eyewitnesses that saw exactly what happened. So do you suspect that maybe there is some entity or some other person that have fired the shot other than an Israeli soldier? Zaid, uh, I think you and other colleagues, of course, this is your briefing. You can ask uh, as many questions as you'd like. You can right. ask the same questions as many okay. times if you'd like. Um, that's uh, not going to change my answer, which is that, one, uh, around the specifics of what transpired, uh, work important work is continuing to being done to ascertain what exactly happened. Um, and we are going to let that process play out. As I've said, as it relates to making those findings public, we expect that to happen as soon as possible. We expect that process to be thorough, transparent, um, and it to be as robust as it can be. Uh, but beyond that, I'm just not going to uh, uh, speculate from up here uh, what happened or uh, why or any of the reasoning side. I, it, it, as I said to so, Rabia, uh, eyewitness accounts are, of course, uh, helpful, key, informative to all of this. Uh, but there is a, a process in place, and we will let that process play out. So would out. you rely on, on the eyewitness accounts, or you just rely on the Israeli? I, I'm not going to speak to the, okay. the process that, side. That, that, that's fine. I yeah. just want to take And again, I just want to reiterate again that we are working closely right. to uh, ascertain the facts, but there is not um, uh, there is not a State Department-led uh, uh, investigation that is going on yeah. as it relates to because this. Because the record, Vidant, is really quite abysmal and when it, and it comes to Israeli investigating, Israel investigating itself on the killing of Americans. I mean, I can take you back to March 16, 2003, when Rachel Corey, a Jewish American, was killed by a bulldozer, you know, in plain sight of everybody. And, you know, the Israelis only came back with an answer in, in, in 2012. And it was just like, you know, I mean, none, nothing there answer kind of a thing. And we saw this happen with Omar Assad. We saw this happen with Shreena Bahakli when it was killed. And you guys came out on July 4th, 2022, on a holiday. And you said that the intention was not there. So what is there, what guarantee do we have that this investigation, this particular investigation, that saw the murder of a 26-year-old American, uh, Aisha Noor Egi, so we, we saw her murder. Everybody, you know, uh, there are a lot of accounts and so on. What guarantee do you have that this will be carried out, the investigation will be carried out thoroughly, fairly, transparently, and would lead to the proper result as far as you're concerned? So, in terms so I'm, not going to, I, I'm not going to color any of these findings un, until we see them. So I will just leave it at that. And uh, I'm not going to get ahead of the process here. So do, do we have, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, I need, let me just... And do we have uh, any evidence from the past that Israel actually comes through on these investigations? I will let the IDF and uh, the Israeli government speak to their but, own uh, 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 accountability processes site. I'm not going to get into that. But at every possible measure uh, we raise, we reiterate um, the uh, reminder to that civilian death 
need to be minimized, uh, not just in Gaza, right. but also when actions uh, are being conducted in the West Bank, uh, that it is critical and vital to uh, peace and stability in the region, taking that moral and strategic imperative. My, uh, la my last thing on this, I mean, when it, it comes to the Israeli killing of Americans, you know, Americans that are being killed by Israel and their families, they feel that these Americans are the children of a lesser God, because Israel is committing the crime, Israel is committing the murder. Is that true? Uh, it's not. Uh, look, it's not true. Said, I, I'm not sure I fully uh, understand your question. I mean, there there but, are less but, Americans than, let's say, when Israel commits, it's, it is really the identity of the killer rather than the identity of, of the killed, so to speak. So, uh, again, I'm not sure I fully comprehend what you're asking, but let me just be pretty clear about this. Uh, in this context, um, in any context, uh, to this government, to this State Department, uh, an American citizen is an American citizen. A blue passport holder is a blue passport holder. Whether they are a Palestinian American citizen, a Turkish American citizen, an Israeli American citizen, um, uh, the front part of that uh, uh, the front part of that uh, that nomenclature um, is not nearly as important to us as uh, the second half. And the fact that uh, an American citizen is an American citizen, and we take this and we take the safety and security of American citizens uh, incredibly seriously. It is. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time up here talking about foreign policy priorities and national security uh, and uh, our hopes for uh, uh, the world when it comes to foreign policy priorities. But I will tell you that uh, for Secretary Blinken, for, for President Biden, there is uh, nothing uh, more important than the safety and security of American citizens. So Israel gets no exceptionalism. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you said you'll look for more information from an independent Israeli investigation. That's been the same U.S. posture for Hindu Job, who was killed 224 days ago. So Ravi's question, how can people, how can Aishinoor's family take an investigation seriously if it's conducted by the perpetrator and, moreover, if they've continued delayed and reportedly lied to the U.S. about their investigation? into Hindu job. Well, that is exactly why we have called and have continued to call for these uh, processes to be as swift and as thorough as possible. And we have that same expectation um, here as well. And we'll but continue we've seen to press. Outcome. It's been 224 days since Hindu job was killed. And in the same instance, for example, we've seen open source reporting, eyewitness accounts that evidently show a potential human rights violation. You say, you know, you're pushing for a swift investigation. If that's the same posture with this, when can Americans expect a conclusion? Uh, any American can expect that this administration and this government will uh, do everything we can to um, ascertain and gather whatever information is required. And I'm going to let that process play out. Uh, I don't have any uh, policy announcements to make, Prem, but we will uh, continue to raise this directly with our partners in Israel, and that, that work has been ongoing. Okay, wait, Go one more question. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Um, to Said's question, the U.S. Yeah. says it demands respect for press colleagues, then Israeli forces kill our colleague Shreena Abuakla and scores of Palestinian journalists. The U.S. says it supports aid workers. Then Israeli forces kill American Jacob Flickinger and plenty of other aid workers, including Palestinians. The U.S. says it condemns illegal settlement activity. And then Israeli forces kill Aishin Oregi, Rachel Corey, and scores of Palestinians subject to settler violence. Um, another New Jersey teacher last month was shot by Israeli forces as he did the same thing Aishin was doing. How many more Palestinians and how many more Americans killed, violated, will it take before this administration actually does announce a policy change? So, Prem, uh, I will say this, that one of the reasons we are uh, so uh, squarely focused on working to get a ceasefire deal uh, is because of the, uh, the calm and the stability and the potential it has for that, not just in the immediate Gaza Strip and the surrounding areas, but the region broadly, and the benefits that it could have when it comes to peace and stability and calm and the reduction of tensions in the West Bank as well. Uh, certainly, uh, the death of any uh, journalist, aid worker, civilian, whether they're an American citizen or not, is heartbreaking. Um, and it is a... Uh, there are no words. There are no words for the for the pain um, uh, that it brings, especially for these individuals' families. Uh, but we will continue to stress uh, directly to all that there is a moral and strategic imperative to minimize the impacts on civilians, and we will continue to press on that um, uh, uh, as uh, aggressively as we need to. God, you had your I hand up. You yeah, I want to stay in the West Bank, but I will go to the current escalation there. Yeah. 
And uh, today, uh, the Israeli finance minister put a tweet on X, if that expression is correct now. But he said, literally, that it's the mission of his life is to create reality on the ground to block any future Palestinian state. So, I mean, what he means about two-state solution, he want to kill it. And during the latest security operations, Israeli security operations in Yemen and then in Nablus, there were, it was accompanied and in parallel by settlers' violence, season of land, etc. And I, I looked through my emails this morning to see if there is any response from the State Department regarding small and I didn't find any. Are, are you okay with his statement? Certainly not. Look, uh, th that is the kind of rhetoric we would. Uh, <coughs> take issue with uh, uh, because a two-state solution um, and the work being done to get there is uh, so vital to our approach to uh, the Middle East and what we hope to see uh, for the region. Uh, our focus, however, is on um, the policies and on uh, uh, engaging uh, with this government, um, its government, this government in its totality, not just um, one-off colorful characters who uh, might make up uh, certain sectors of this government. Um, and so that is the, the, the task at hand and what we're focused on. Uh, well, more specifically, more specifically, as it relates to uh, destabilizing actions in the West Bank, whether it be uh, additional sanction, uh, additional uh, settlement activity, whether it be additional outpost activity, whether it be settler violence, um, we have not hesitated to call those out for what they are. When it comes to settlement and uh, outpost activity, we continue to feel strongly, vehemently, that uh, these kinds of actions, uh, not only are they inconsistent with international law, they are detractions from Israel's own stated goal of wanting more security. They're detractions from our own goal of wanting uh, security for Israel uh, in the region. And so uh, we have, over the course of this administration, taken steps to hold those who incite violence to account, and we'll continue to do that should that be necessary. I mean, I, I assume that you refer to the visa restrictions and visa blocking through some of the settlers, but this was regarding violence. I'm talking about land seizure here. I mean, it's been going on for decades now. You're calling it out, doesn't seem to stop it. And you're blocking anybody else from taking any action toward that, whether it's the UN Security Council or any uh, any other countries. So do you, do you see that you are, by not doing anything except calling it out, you're allowing it? Uh, I, I, I would I would I would absolutely uh, uh, take uh, I would take issue with that characterization. Um, uh, we have and we'll continue to have tools in our disposal, whether it's uh, visa restrictions or not, they are uh, actual levers that this government um can pull, and when we see things like settlement activity or outpost, uh, we're not we're not hesitant to raise them and raise them immediately, and uh, just make clear how problematic this kind of behavior is, uh, not just for Israel's overall security, but. Uh, for what we are trying to focus on right now, which is getting a ceasefire deal across the finish line. Thank you. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, uh, yeah. A couple of questions on Ukraine. In light of reports that uh, some citing uh, you know, very credible sources, some even citing Iranian officials, yeah. that Tehran has already sent hundreds of short-range uh, ballistic missiles, uh, Fatih 360, uh, to, to Russia to use in Ukraine. First of all, how alarmed are you? And secondly, is it time to allow Ukraine to destroy the, those warehouses storing them in Russia? So, look, Alex, I, I, no uh, new policy changes to announce, but uh, we're, of course, incredibly alarmed by these reports. Any transfer of uh, Iranian ballistic missiles to Russia would represent a uh, dramatic escalation in Iran's support for Russia's war of aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, been clear, our partners uh, throughout the G7 um, and the NATO summits have been clear that uh, we're prepared to deliver uh, significant consequences. I'm not going to get ahead of that or preview them from here. But uh, Alex, you and I, going back, I don't know how long now, I have talked about the increasingly concerned about the deepening security partnership uh, between Russia and Iran since the onset of Russia's uh, full-scale evasion. Um, it is something that we are continuing to pay close attention to. Uh, but to put the focus on Iran for a second, uh, President Peveshkin um, continues to say publicly that improving um, his country's failing economy uh, depends on improving his foreign relations and Iran's standing in the world. At the same time, though, um, you cannot have it both ways, as uh, such a reported uh, missile transfer uh, would 
basically threaten um, international safety and the international order. So we will continue to judge Iran by its actions. But in terms of my point about you know uh, you know letting them you know strike the arrows rather than striking the shooter, um, not only the U.S. administration is you know refusing to change policy, we also are not allowing the U.K. to use you know to let Ukraine use its own weapons. Um, why? And secondly, is the secretary discussing this topic in London? So, look, uh, support for Ukraine, I expect it to be a, a major topic of, uh, of uh, conversation when the secretary has his um, government to government meetings tomorrow. I'm not going to get ahead of that uh, process. I, I'm sure you all will hear from him um, uh, early for those that plan on tuning into his press conference. Uh, beyond that, uh, Alex, I'm just not going to uh, speculate on potential actions the United States may or may not take. Uh, let me just say, we have been clear and consistent about our uh, support for Ukraine uh, and making sure that they have what they need to defend themselves uh, and defend themselves from uh, attacks just immediately across the border as well. And we'll continue uh, to take a look at uh, what is required so that um, uh, our partners in Ukraine can do that. Thank you. I have one more Iran, if I may. Next okay. week will mark uh, two years since the killing of uh, Masa Amini. Uh, is it time to you know, move forward in terms of implementation of Masa Act? Why is it taking this long? So uh, I don't have any uh, updates for you there, uh, uh, Alex, but uh, of course the human rights atrocities in Iran is uh, something that we are paying close attention to. And of course it continues to be inconsistent with uh, what we find to be President Peveshkin's own um, stated goal. Uh, and we'll uh, appropriately take action uh, should we need to. Shannon, go ahead. Thank you, Don. Uh, the House of Foreign Affairs Committee's latest report on Afghanistan and the withdrawal says that droves of classified material were left at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. The State Department responded by saying it's standard operating procedure to reduce the amount of sensitive material that remains and that Embassy Kabul's drawdown was conducted in accordance with standard operating procedures, but doesn't clearly answer whether classified material was left behind. Can you say if it was and how much? So uh, I certainly uh, would not uh, get into something like that from uh, up here, but uh, can say confidently that uh, the uh, drawdown in uh, at Mission Kabul was conducted uh, uh, not just uh, by the book, but appropriately um, uh, consistent with the standards and the protocols that are in place for um, appropriate drawdowns in NEOs. Uh, and since you've opened up the question, um, Shannon, if, you, if you'll allow me, uh, you know, there's a lot uh, of you that have interest today in, in Chairman McCall's uh, report. So I just want to say uh, we should be very clear about something, which is that when President Biden took office, he was faced with a choice, uh, ramp up uh, the war in Afghanistan and put more American troops at risk, or finally end our involvement in uh, America's longest war after two decades of American uh, presidents sending troops to fight and die in Afghanistan. Uh, we are stronger today uh, because of uh, this decision uh, that President Biden made. The one that he made was the right one. Um, and it's also important to understand that this exercise that um, the House majority um, is undertaking is uh, is about scoring political points. Uh, this investigation had the potential to truly be bipartisan and produce real legislative proposals to better prepare uh, the United States for future presidents and for future parties uh, for future challenges. Uh, Instead, uh, the majority chose uh, to seek scandal over substance, and this quote-unquote investigation seems to not actually have uncovered anything new, and instead is a collection of uh, cherry-picked comments from various transcribed interviews and interviews uh, designed to paint an inaccurate picture uh, of this administration's efforts. Um, this uh, exercise is a uh, it's a disservice to Afghanistan policy and uh, a disservice to the lens that we try to look at the region through uh, by turning it into a hyper partisan debate. So just can I follow up quickly? Yeah, it's just, so just so I'm clear, the State Department's position is you can't say publicly yes or no whether I just wouldn't get into those well. kinds of operational um, uh, specifics when it comes to how we uh, draw down our presence in any at any uh, diplomatic post. Uh, but what I can say is that the drawdown in Kabul uh, was conducted uh, in a in a manner which is consistent with our uh, departments and our country's standards and protocols uh, when faced in in those circumstances. And lastly, just do you have a figure on how many Americans still in Afghanistan that the State Department is in contact with right now? Um, uh, 
Uh, I, I'm happy to check. Uh, I don't have a, a number at my fingertips, but I'm happy to like, check and get back to you. Uh, what I, but l let me just say, uh, Shannon, since you've asked the, the question on our efforts in Afghanistan, uh, we are issuing, um, uh, I know your question was about uh, Americans, but let me just say, uh, uh, as it relates to our broader resettlement efforts, we are issuing SIVs to our Afghan partners in record rates. In fiscal year 23, we issued more than 18,000 um, Afghan SIVs, uh, the most in a single year. And in this fiscal year, uh, we've already surpassed that figure. Um, and as a reminder, when the president took office, uh, the State Department inherited a backlog of more than 17,000 SIV applicants. Uh, Kylie. Um, Poll gets given, everybody. Given that the uh, Republicans' report is nine. out today, um, I think it's worth asking you guys questions about your own after action report that was done uh, more than a year ago now. I'm just wondering if you have updates for us as to. Uh, the recommendations that were made in that report and which of those recommendations have actually gone to effect. So, um, uh, Kylie, for, for operational specifics, I, I'm not going to get into some of the specific re recommendations that have been made, but it I can say... It was an unclassified report. I, I, I understand. I understand. Um, uh, I, I'm happy to see if we have more specifics for you, but on some of the preparedness um, aspects and uh, the aspects involving uh, American citizens, I know that we have been able to uh, successfully implement those in... Uh, uh, previous iterations uh, in uh, circumstances in Ukraine, um, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, uh, but I'm happy to check if we've got a more exhaustive list of, of where some of these actions are uh, in true effect. Yeah, if you could just update us as to if any of those recommendations have been implemented. Sure. I, think, um, I, I, I can say questions. certainly that a number of them have been implemented, particularly when it comes to the planning for crises, when it comes to uh, uh, the planning for crises as it relates to coordination between uh, the department here and folks at the field. Uh, there have been a number of steps that have been taken in relation to um, how we handle uh, American citizens who um, do not are not under chief of mission authority. Um, so there are a number of steps uh, that I know we have seen come to light in some other parts of the world, but I'm happy to see if we've got a more specific litany for you. Okay. Yeah, Nick, go ahead. A follow-up to the report. Is there any resolution now to the threat um, to hold the secretary in contempt from Chairman McCall if he doesn't testify before September 19th? Or is that so I, I think that's a better question for uh, uh, Chairman McCall. What I can say is that um, uh, to say that this department and this secretary haven't engaged with the committee and, uh, and haven't engaged with uh, Congress on its legitimate oversight responsibilities are inaccurate. Uh, we have been in near uh, constant communication uh, with the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we have provided uh, more than 23,000 pages of documents to Congress, conducted nine high-level briefings for committees and members of the House and Senate. We have made available or engaged 15 senior officials for transcribed interviews to the House Foreign Affairs Committee and staff members. Secretary Blinken himself has already testified before House and Senate committees 14 times on Afghanistan, including four times directly uh, before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, the majority isn't truly interested in legislating on Afghanistan policy. Uh, if they were, they would have sought to speak to the secretary long ago. They would have sought to speak to him um, to get his input as it uh, makes this report, which is uh, purportedly supposed to be this uh, big reflection on Afghanistan policy and work being done in the region. Instead, they waited until the report was completely finished uh, uh, to come come back to us. So uh, I, will, I, I will let you draw your own conclusions to, to what that means. Uh, uh, so uh, I know that we uh, spoke to this a little bit last week as it relates to continuing to engage with uh, Congress on um, uh, possible alternative engagements. Uh, I know Matt Miller spoke to that a little bit. I don't have any updates for you beyond that. So, Michelle, go, back go ahead. To the Middle East. Sure. Uh, first, do you expect any changes uh, on the Israeli Hezbollah front, especially that Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, urged his government yesterday to prepare for changing the situation uh, on that front? Uh, I, I have no changes to preview or predict, Michelle. What I can say is that uh, we, one of the reasons we are continue to be so committed to a ceasefire and getting one across the finish line is because the benefits that it could have in the north for creating the conditions so that both Israeli and Lebanese civilians could be able to return home. But I don't have anything to, to, to predict beyond that. 
Uh, on Iraq, should we expect any announcement uh, soon regarding the future of U.S. military presence uh, there? So, Michelle, we've held discussions with the government of Iraq on the future of uh, Operation Inherent Resolve uh, since last year. Uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Sudani spoke about this in April um, during the Prime Minister's visit. Uh, in that joint statement between those two leaders, they affirmed that these conversations would be ongoing and they would review these factors uh, to determine when and how the mission of the global coalition in Iraq would end uh, and transition uh, in an orderly manner to a um, more enduring bilateral security partnership. Those conversations are ongoing. I don't have anything to, to, to get ahead of on that process. The report said that there will be an announcement this month regarding the start. Uh, uh, I, I have, start I have no uh, nothing to offer as it relates to the timeline beyond just saying that that is work that's ongoing. And lastly, yeah. uh, report said that uh, the U.S. government told Iraqi official uh, or officials that Iraqi banks uh, ex exploited their access to U.S. dollars to support the Quds Force and the militia groups operating uh, in Iraq. Do you have any comments on that? So uh, I'm sure my colleagues at the Treasury Department would be uh, happy to speak to you a little bit more about this. But from here, what I can say is that we'll continue to collaborate closely with um, our uh, partners in Iraq uh, as it relates to their banking and finance system, to move them away from a cash system, to uh, make them more resilient uh, uh, against uh, terrorist and counterterrorism threats and cyber activities and things of that nature uh, but I don't have anything to speculate but are on these that. reports uh, I don't have anything I don't have anything to offer on that Can I Jaleel on the Gaza negotiation? go ahead yeah. then I'll come to you Jaleel go ahead uh, the go Washington ahead. Post reported uh, I believe Friday or Saturday that the the U.S. now at, at its assessment that there will be no ceasefire during this presidency and they are putting in on cold whatever new proposals you are working on to the to the both parties and the belief now within the administration that neither Hamas nor Israel are seeking this. Can you confirm? Uh, so look, I'm not going to uh, comment on uh, purported speculation on, uh, on, on a diplomatic process. What I can say is uh, echo what President Biden and Secretary Blinken and Vice President Harris have said, which is that we are pursuing all efforts to secure a deal that would release the hostages being held by Hamas, that would um, create the conditions for additional um, humanitarian aid to get into Gaza, create the conditions for greater diplomacy to happen to bring about peace and stability in the region. Uh, that line of effort um, continues, and I'm just not going to speculate or get into the process beyond that. Jalil, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vidan. Yeah. I'm sorry, I originally had three questions, but just one extra added because of Shannon's question. Yeah. So you said the Afghanistan withdrawal was uh, State Department uh, did good, but there was no ambassador at the time of the withdrawal, right? That is correct. Uh, that the, there, there was no U.S. ambassador, but the U.S. military personnel were left there, right? Uh, I'm I'm not sure how you there mean was no Jalil. ambassador, U.S. ambassador at the time of the U.S. withdrawal under President Biden. Sure, at the onset of this administration, yes, there was not a Senate confirmed uh, ambassador to Afghanistan, but that is uh, frankly a little bit uh, besides the point because when it comes to any diplomatic facility that we have around the world, uh, not only do we have robust teams in place, but when there is not an ambassador there, there is a, a charge day affair that is the senior most uh, diplomatic person on the ground leading the efforts, leading the chief of mission. Uh, that continued to be the case uh, in Afghanistan. And there were a number of individuals who actually came out of uh, government, who came out of retirement, rejoin government service um, to help uh, lead uh, these final months, uh, including Ambassador uh, Ross Wilson, who was uh, the last uh, uh, last and senior most uh, civilian on the ground uh, in Afghanistan prior uh, to the withdrawal. Okay. Uh, um, uh, just today, a few hours ago, the leader of the opposition in Pakistan parliament, Mr. Gohar, another parliamentarian, Marwat, another uh, uh, a few parliamentarians are already arrested. A few, there's uh, reports that they are going to be arrested. I have mentioned to you several times that the democracy in Pakistan is uh, uh, under threat. Do you have anything about the, to say about these arrests? Or, uh, uh, I will let still the, see the d democracy bright in Pakistan? I, I will let the Pakistani uh, justice and law enforcement speak, system speak to, to any of those issues. Go okay, ahead. just yeah. one last one with them. Uh, I'm gonna just one little bit. You got you got two already. You got two already. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah. I have uh, two questions, one in Venezuela, one in China. Sure. Um, the first one is, um, over the weekend, Edmundo Gonzalez um, seek asylum in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, what's the reaction from the United States and the worries? So, look, uh, let's not forget that the Venezuelan people overwhelmingly voted for change. Uh, but uh, the repression and crackdown on human rights and the threatening of opposition officials that we're seeing um, uh, all around Venezuela has forced uh, the winning candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, into exile as Maduro has and continues to kill or jail thousands of Venezuelans. Uh, our intention, the United States, is going is to continue to support uh, the winners of the July 28th presidential election and collaborate closely with our international partners to achieve the goal of a peaceful restoration of democracy in Venezuela. That is the Venezuelan people's aspirations. On China, um, mm -hmm. late June, four American instructors were stabbed in China. Yesterday, the Chinese Communist Party singled out a member of the U.S. mission in China for um, for attack. What actions is the U.S. government taking to protect American citizens and diplomats in China? So, look, any threat against chief of mission personnel, uh, this is something the U.S. government would take seriously, and any potential threat against other U.S. personnel, we would take that incredibly seriously. Again, uh, we take the safety and security of American citizens overseas to the, uh, the, the highest priority, and that includes, of course, those uh, working in our department as well. Nick, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Simon, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. The yeah. Um, after the election, you, you said uh, that Gonzalez uh, was the winner, but you haven't said that he, you haven't said you recognize him as president elect. Is that still the case? So, look, the, when we're talking about what happens uh, next year, Simon, or what should happen next year, is that the regime needs to uh, form and have some sort of transition back to democracy. What that exactly looks like uh, needs to reflect the will of the Venezuelan people. Uh, I, we're not going to be pers per prescriptive about it from here. Uh, certainly, though, from uh, our assessment, uh, Mr. Gonzalez was the winner, uh, and that is why, for so long, leading up to this point, Simon, we called called for the tabulations and the vote counts as it relates to this to be made public. The, the, obviously, those tabulations uh, uh, don't seem to be forthcoming. You've been kind of referring to the you know regional countries to, to try to, to get some movement on this, but it doesn't the fact that the winner, the person you say won the election, has, has now fled the country, does that sort of mark that your approach to this has, has basically not been successful and maybe you need to switch to a, to a new approach? Not, not at all, Simon, because um, uh, nothing is off the table and in close coordination with our partners, including those that we engage with regularly on this, we're considering a range of options to demonstrate to Maduro and um, his uh, uh, representatives that their misgovernments, their crackdown on human rights, their uh, disregard for democracy and free and fair elections has real and legitimate consequences. I'm not going to preview or get into those from here, but uh, we have and will continue to enforce appropriate action in Venezuela consistent with uh, the actions and non-actions taken by Maduro uh, and his people. Uh, go ahead, Nick. Um, yeah. Just following up on Afghanistan, yeah. because you mentioned Ambassador Wilson, yeah. and this report is particularly critical of him, um, saying, among other things, he took a two-week vacation the last week of July and the first week of August as Afghanistan was crumbling, that he fled the embassy ahead of the embassy staff to go to Kaya, and that he had COVID during the evacuation and covered that up and got a foreign service officer to take a test for him in Doha so that he could return to the United States. Do you have any response to any of those accusations? So um, I, I'm just not going to get into a, a, a tit for tat with uh, uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, but what I can say is that um, it is not my understanding that uh, he was um, uh, on vacation uh, at the beginning of August. Uh, beyond that, uh, I will just echo what I said previously about Ambassador Wilson, that this is a esteemed individual, a uh, decorated foreign service officer, a decorated senior foreign service officer um, that so many uh, colleagues here hold uh, in the highest regard who came back into government service um, to help lead this process. Him, along with a number of other uh, senior leaders uh, across the department that stepped up um, in, a, in, a, in a time of need, uh, and he uh, should be uh, commended. Um, and, and let's, again, lot not lose sight of uh, the fact that when we're talking about Afghanistan, we're talking about Afghanistan policy, um, uh, what 
administration it was that signed the Doha Agreement, what administration it was that uh, uh, left a backlog of 17,000 SIVs, that uh, uh, left Afghanistan policy in a place uh, so that this administration could not start its uh, transition in an, uh, in, a, in an appropriate time. Uh, go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Uh, um, already one month, Bangladesh has an interim government. How does uh, the U.S. plan to engage with uh, Dr. Yunus led Bangladesh in the aftermath on the unrest on August 5th, especially to democratic election? And secondly, there have been claims about Chinese influence in Bangladeshi recent student protests. How does U.S. assess this situation and does it perceive any strategic concern in the region? So, uh, look, we're continuing to monitor the uh, developments in Bangladesh close, closely. Uh, we continue to be ready and eager to uh, work with um, interim uh, government that's led by uh, uh, Dr. Yunus as it charts its democratic future uh, for the people of Bangladesh. Beyond that, I'm just uh, not going to speculate. Thank you. And uh, some Indian media outlets have suggested U.S. involvement uh, in the anti-government protest in Bangladesh. While India has historically been a close ally of the outstate government. Could this allegation strain U.S.-India relationship? So I've not seen those reports, but what I can unequivocally say is that they are uh, not true. That's uh, probably why I've not seen them. Then uh, finally, Nazira, go ahead. Final question. I got to work the room. Uh, Nazira, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. As you mentioned a lot about Afghanistan, there are so many problems, especially regarding women. Nowadays, a bunch of Afghan professor and teachers send me a letter, a bunch of a signature. The Taliban, uh, don't give them uh, retirement, and this former uh, retirement teacher and the other uh, category, they want money. They are very old. I don't know it's related to the State Department or, or not. They asked me, they have a high expectation to pass uh, their message. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I totally caught that, but let me just uh, let, let me reiterate something you've heard me and so many others say that uh, when it comes to uh, our Afghanistan policy going forward, one of the things that is key is central is our support for Afghan women and girls um, and uh, the anything that the United States can do as it relates to um, making sure that the Taliban takes steps to change its behavior. The Taliban has stated that international recognition is their own stated goal. Um, that is not going to happen as it continues to keep 50% uh, of its population behind. It keep, continues to keep 50% of its population um, in the dark. Uh, and so we, in close coordination with allies and partners, will we'll take appropriate action um, if we need to. In the back. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the Israeli foreign minister declared that the forced uh, dis uh, displacement of the people in Gaza should also happen in the West Bank. Despite of this seriousness statements, we didn't hear any uh, condemnation from U.S. Special concern. We have time and time and time again um, said that forced displacement of the Palestinian people, whether it be in Gaza or whether it be in the West Bank, would be inconsistent with what uh, we want to see in the region. And it is certainly inconsistent with the principles that Secretary Blinken laid out uh, in Tokyo in last December. Excuse John, me. Go ahead. Just, uh, I, I got to work the room. Okay. Go ahead. Um, both yourself and Mr. Miller have talked about these ongoing investigations when it relates both to the death of U.S. citizens mm -hmm. as well as international humanitarian law. One of the things that was mentioned when the NSM-20 report came out was that it was inconclusive because there were no U.S. State Department personnel on the ground to verify those claims. Has that changed? In Gaza. In, what, in, in Gaza. Correct. correct. Yes. Has that changed? And what would be the conditions to put State Department personnel on the ground to actually uh, finalize some of those reports? That has not changed. Um, and I think uh, when President Biden has said uh, no boots on the ground in Gaza, it is pretty clear. Um, I'm not going to speculate on what would be required for those circumstances to change, but that is correct. We do not have uh, personnel on the ground uh, in Gaza. So those All reports right. can't be Thanks, concluded. everybody. I'm going to wrap there.